Hello, and welcome to the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast. I'm your host, Shannon Crow. My pronouns are she, her, hers. This podcast is being recorded on the traditional territory of the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Mississauga people. I am passionate about continuing to learn about the culture of the Anishinaabe people while also learning about my settler ancestors who came here to Turtle Island generations ago. If you are new here and wondering who I am, I'm a Canadian yoga teacher, mom of three, entrepreneur, and a forever student who loves to ask questions. That's why I get really excited about podcasting because I get to ask questions about yoga and running a business and life. And I get to talk to some amazing people each and every week, amazing people like today's guest. I'm so grateful that you are here with me today so that we can learn together. And also we have a really cool book giveaway. So stay tuned. We have three books to give away to three lucky podcast listeners. Today's episode is powered by Offering Tree. I use and love this software in my own business because it automates everything from bookings to payments to Zoom links, reminders, and so much more. And we have a special podcast listener discount code over at offeringtree.com slash Shannon. Today's episode is also sponsored by Pelvic Health Professionals. This is the other hat that I wear. I get really excited to talk about anything that relates to pelvic health and weave yoga into that. And this is where my curiosity (laughs) took off. I followed this niche and it eventually grew into a yoga teacher training and then into this membership where you can join, pay a monthly fee, kind of like Netflix, only I think better. Everything in there is focused on pelvic health information. You get to learn the most up-to-date information from worldwide pelvic health experts. Visit pelvichealthprofessionals.com to check it out. And like you, if you're a yoga teacher, I really like to see how we can bring this into our yoga classes or the one-on-one sessions that we do with people. And so you'll find that that is a huge focus in there. So to check that out, again, it's pelvichealthprofessionals.com. Today's podcast is part of a series that we're doing this month where I really wanted to focus in on niching down, specializing, and we are going to be talking to a yoga teacher who did just that. This entire podcast, all of the episodes up to this point, and now we're already at episode 350, They're here for you because I get how it feels to be out in the real world as a yoga teacher. I wanted yoga teachers to have a place where they could connect to ideas, information, and a supportive community of other yoga teachers. Like I said, we are talking about niching down or specializing or highlighting a yoga teacher who has a real niche. We're doing that all of November 2023. So we have a couple more episodes in this series and we might even continue with this as well because I love talking about it. So this week, I'm excited because we're talking about yoga for autism and special needs. The World Health Organization estimates that about one in a hundred children globally has autism spectrum disorder, yet there is still such a lot of misconception and misunderstanding about people with autism and other special needs. Shawnee Thornton Hardy joins me today to share more about how yoga can support people in this community. Shawnee is the founder of Asanas for Autism and Special Needs and the founder and director of Yoga Therapy for Youth Certification Program. She's worked with children and adults with autism and individuals with diverse needs for almost three decades, specializing in working with children and adults that have significant cognitive and language delays, sensory processing challenges, significant behavior challenges, and trauma histories. Shawnee's goal is to bring the experience of yoga and somatic practices to all individuals, no matter their differences or challenges. She's also a published author of two books, One is Asanas for Autism, and the other book, we're giving three of these books away. So to enter in the draw for one of these books, 
All you have to do is head over to our show notes page for today's episode. That's over at theconnectedyogateacher.com slash 350. Or you can go into our website and just look for the latest podcast or go into the search and type in autism or special needs and it will come up with this episode. When you leave a comment, that enters you into the book draw. So you leave your comment and we'll do the book draw in a couple of weeks. You can also share your thoughts on today's episode as you listen as well. Anyway, back to the book that we're giving away. It's called Yoga Therapy for Children and Teens with Complex Needs. In our conversation today, Shawnee talks about the children and teenagers that she works with, what their challenges might be, and how she sees that yoga is really an effective help for them. She explains some yoga practices that can also help with anger and anxiety and how to bring calm into a yoga class or how to bring that calm in for a person who just has really high energy. So if you've ever taught a yoga class and thought, oh my gosh, how can I get people to kind of ground a little bit more, calm down a little bit more, or if you have a student who has really high energy, this is one to have a listen to. We also discuss why it's important to treat each child as an individual and to let go of preconceived ideas about them or the label that they walk in with when we know, okay, this person has a special needs label, how to not just base everything that we do on that. This was such an informative and educational conversation, and I cannot wait to share it with you. So remember, after you have a listen, make sure to go over to our show notes page or even partway through as you start to listen, enter in any comment about this episode. Maybe you have a question, maybe you learned something. Go do that over at theconnectedyogateacher.com slash 350. And then we will be doing a draw for three of the books and sending them out to three of our listeners. Welcome to the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast, Shawnee. It's so great to have you here today. Thank you, Shannon. I'm happy to be here. I'm really excited that we get to talk about teaching yoga to kids and teens who have complex needs. Uh, but before we sort of dive into all of this, tell us what is the work that you do and who do you do it for? Yeah, so that's a a good question. And I have a broad amount or array of work that I do. So I work with uh, children. And I work with the younger parts of children of adults. So I work the whole gamut from, you know, early childhood to all the way up to, um, you know, later stages of life in terms of the people that I work with in my therapeutic practice. But a big bulk of my work is with children and teens uh, with complex needs. And I know that we can expand a little bit more on what complex needs means, but um, it's something that I've been an area of work I've been in for almost three decades. I started off as a educator and then moved into the realm of a behavior specialist and then moved into the realm of uh, integrating these uh, practices of yoga therapy and somatic embodiment, uh, which is primarily what I'm doing now in the work that I do, both in offering one-to-one sessions and also teaching trainings and um, sharing these practices with others who want to share it in their communities. That's amazing. What inspired you to do this work? Was it working as an educator and seeing the need there or, or what kind of fueled it? Yeah, that question really takes me back to my childhood and my experiences growing up and having gone through a lot of um, adverse experiences and always really having a love for children and really having this dharmic path of, of knowing when I was younger that I wanted to work with kids. And when I lived in Boston, I moved there when I was 17, I worked as a preschool assistant And even in my book, I mentioned this young boy, his name is Austin, as one of my gurus, um, because at the time there wasn't a lot of understanding about neurodiversity, about autism. And 
you know, he was this quirky, wonderful young kid who really struggled in the context of the um, uh, preschool system that he was in. And so he was really one of my first teachers and one of the first gurus that led me on this path and this work because I really wanted to learn how to support him. And we had this really strong bond with each other. Um, and so that was that was really the start of this path of wanting to know and learn more about um, children, you know, with with diverse ways of navigating the world. And so now do you you lead specific yoga classes for kids and teens who, let's say, have autism or who are neurodivergent? Like what sorts of labels on the kids are coming to your class if that is that the yeah. way I should <laughs> word it because I feel well, like there are a lot of labels absolutely there are there are labels and and the way that I, I like to think about labels is that it can be helpful to understand a diagnosis that a child or teen may have because we can have a sense of what some of their challenges or complications may be but then once we know the label, we go deeper beneath and just look at that child or teen as 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 just a human being and get to know their specific um, not only challenges but also strengths and you know their individual ways of navigating the world. Um, and so that's the way I like to think of and I do quote unquote labels, right? Because um, uh, there can be a helpful element to understanding. And then also we want to push that aside when it comes to actually looking at that individual person or human being outside of the context of just a label. Uh, I, I did lead classes at one time. So, and, and mainly I started integrating these practices into my programming, my behavior pro programming with the kids and teens that I worked with. Um, a lot of different backgrounds of autism, ADHD, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, um, intellectual disability, and other motor impairments, sensory processing challenges, um, kids that came from pretty significant trauma backgrounds that were in either foster system or in um, more group home settings. Um, and so a lot of behavioral challenges, a lot of dysregulation in their nervous systems, a lot of um, difficulty with, uh, you know, self-regulation and managing their emotions. Um, also, a lot of kids that struggled with sensory processing and also with communication. So I integrated and wove these practices into my education program and my behavior program. And that's really what led to me moving out of the realm of just teaching, um, you know, classes to groups of kids to leading training. So that's really what I do mostly now. Um, and I also, as I said, you know, work more one-to-one -one in the therapeutic uh, yoga therapy and somatic experiencing integration approach. So initially it began as me actually integrating it into my education program. And then it just developed and grew from there after I saw what the significant impact that those practices had on, on the kids and teens in my program. Um, so that's really, you know, it's been such a natural path of being in the education system and seeing some of the challenges with that and then bringing in some of these more, um, you know, therapeutic modalities or modalities that focus on self-regulation and embodiment. Uh, and so they've just really significantly impacted those kids over the years that I've worked with both one-to-one -one and in class settings. Let's say there's a yoga teacher listening right now who teaches kids or teens and they have uh, a young person who shows up in their class with complex needs. What would you... What would your, you know, top three or top five things or whatever the very basics be for that teacher who's like, oh, gosh, how do I how do I teach to this person or what do I need to know? Yeah, well, my first thought that comes to mind is that, um, you know, how can we ground ourselves in the sense of 
helping this individual child or human, whoever's in front of us, feel a sense of belonging um, where we don't create othering or create an experience of of not um, having that felt sense of belonging in the class. Uh, so really just looking at how can we help this child or individual feel like they're part of the community, that they're part of the class, that they're not separate from, or that we are somehow honing our attention in on this one person and making it all about them. So we have to find a balance between helping uh, that child to feel welcomed, but also not feeling like there's so much attention on them. Um, you know, because they're different from everyone else. And that can be a big challenge. It does require sometimes, you know, having some training or understanding about different ways that we can support. And I, I, I use the term different um, brains, bodies, and abilities, because you'll have children come in with different uh, brains, the brains that navigate the world in a different way, different bodies that navigate the world in different ways and different abilities. And those abilities can range. Um, It's a spectrum. So to have some ways that you know how to uh, adapt or create an environment that's welcoming and that can also support them and have them be an active participant in your yoga class, you know, where you're not just having a child go into the, and I say this because this is the obligatory pose, child's pose when you can't do what everyone else is doing, right? Um, That you find ways that you can actually have them participate where they're getting the essence of the practice, just like everyone else. And that does require some nuance. It does require um, maybe some training or understanding of how to do that to make those practices inclusive and accessible to anyone that comes to your class. But the first thing is just really helping them feel welcomed and like they belong, you know? Um, And a lot of that is our own inner work in how we're showing up to teach our class and what's coming up for us. And that that's something that we don't have to judge ourselves about that, but we can have an awareness around and that we can um, find ways that we can really show up in an open way without fear or judgment. Um, when someone comes to our class that might present in a different way than our typical students. Now, what trainings do you suggest if someone was starting right at the beginning and they just really wanted to help um, someone with special needs in their class? Are there any books or courses or what would you recommend? So, of course, I would start with my own trainings and books and resources. because my deepest intention in in creating my trainings and in writing my books and in creating the resources that I've created is um, in bringing these practices to all children um, and to really help all children, young adults, teens, whatever age they may be, um, to feel that sense of belonging and to feel included and accepted. Um, and you know, yoga, that's really the foundation of, of the yoga philosophy is that, you know, we are all interconnected and that we want everyone and anyone to feel equally loved, valued, included, important. Um, so my trainings really emphasize that there's a nuance that you have to learn just in teaching children yoga. That's Mm -hmm. different than being an adult yoga teacher right? So what we learn in teaching adult yoga classes can be challenging when we come into teaching children's yoga because their development is so different. Um, The way that we want to approach them might be very different than the way that we teach adults. So there's that element of learning the tools to actually be able to teach children And then we have another layer of nuance in learning the tools to be able to support different bodies. How might we um, give variations of poses or variations of breathing practices? Um, How might we communicate in a way that is accessible to children who might have language processing challenges? How might we use our language in a different way that's uh, more inclusive to uh, um, 
a group of children that are coming from a lot of diverse backgrounds, both in the way that they navigate the world in their brain functioning, but also their experiences that they've had in the world. So um, that's really the focus of, of everything and anything that I've created in my work. Um, so I, I really believe that my, what I offer really does support people in being able to learn these tools and take them into whatever work that they do, not just yoga teachers, but, um, occupational therapists, speech therapists, mental health practitioners, parents, educators. I've had the whole gamut of people come and take the trainings. Uh, so that they can weave that into the work that they're doing. Um, what are some so, of those? Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> what are some of those things that you have seen? You talked about the benefits of yoga for this population. And I'm wondering, like, can you give us some examples of where you shared something and you, and it was like this, I don't know, exciting light bulb moment where you're like, look at how well that worked for this individual. Gosh, yeah, I have so many wonderful examples over the years, but I'll give an example of um, a young boy in my program who, this was years ago, who really struggled with uh, managing his anger. He'd come from a really um, difficult background, very, you know, traumatic background. And, and I, I, um, share this of course, without giving, you know, all of the details to protect, um, confidentiality of this young person. But, um, one of the practices that we would do is when the students came in, in the morning, we would share how we were feeling, whatever emotion we might be arriving with. You know, when our kids are coming into school, we don't know where they're coming from. We don't know what their morning was like. We don't know what's going on internally with them. A lot of the focus was on getting them to be able to express their emotions and find healthy ways to communicate and kind of let some of that energy out of their systems. For instance, if a child's angry there's a lot of fight energy that's happening internally in their physiology of their body. And so if we have a child that's feeling anger, feeling this internal, you know, kind of energy that's happening, and then we just suppress it and tell them, you know, stop being angry or, or, you know, don't, don't communicate your anger. Then all we're doing is suppressing that energy and pretty much creating this container of all of this energy inside that eventually is either going to explode or implode. Right. So this young boy, um, struggled with expressing his anger. And one of the breaths that we would do, uh, was dragon's breath. And, um, dragon's breath was all about breathing out our fire, letting some of that heat and energy come out. We would discuss what do we notice in our bodies when we experience that emotion. You know, I feel heat, my body feels hot, my muscles get tense. And one of the challenges he had is that when he got angry, he would get very destructive. He would, you know, destroy things. He would run out of the classroom and, and leave the environment, which could be danger to himself or others. And so we came up with a, a, a practice where he would hold up a picture of a dragon on a popsicle stick whenever he uh, started to feel the anger rising because the, the intention was to get him to recognize when the beginning of that experience of anger was starting before it got to the explosive point. And when children are angry or when they're dysregulated, they don't have the communication that that prefrontal cortex is not online to facilitate that communication. So him just holding that stick up gave a sign that he was beginning to feel upset. And that was basically him requesting to go outside, do some dragon breathing, release some of that anger, and then come back in when he was ready. And it was tremendously impactful. It reduced those episodes of escalated aggression and, 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 leaving the classroom without, you know, communicating that he needed time and space. And I saw a significant decrease in, in, in those, um, destructive behaviors that were happening. So that's just one example. I mean, I have 
hundreds of examples of ways that these practices have really facilitated um, children being able to come back to baseline more quickly, being able to feel more of a sense of connection to their body, um, even being able to communicate more effectively and be able to learn more effectively. When we have kids that are in a dysregulated state, they're not in a learning space. And so this is my passion is, you know, these practices being in all school settings, us teaching children from a bottom up approach to understand their emotions, what's happening internally inside their bodies. So they can then be in a space to actually be able to learn and engage with others um, in a more connected and curious way. That's amazing. I think that we could all use that as humans, like all children and adults. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love this awareness of like putting that popsicle stick up. I think you said it was a popsicle stick. Yeah, with a, a popsicle stick with just a dragon head <laughs> glued onto it. <laughs> because I think that's one of those things that I myself like noticed in yoga. Oh, I'm going to have way more awareness of like, what I'm feeling emotionally in my physical body, like all of these things. Whereas no one was really asking me that before I started doing yoga. So I think, I think it can make a big difference to even know how that's going to feel when that emotion starts to arise and know which emotion it is also. Yeah. I mean, that's that self-awareness, right? I mean, that's, that's really what we're turning towards is having this, this awareness of, what is happening inside of my body? What am I noticing? What emotion emotion am I experiencing? And then how can I express this emotion in a way that is supportive and empowering? You know, and so a big focus in my work with children and teens is empowerment. And empowerment is not raging and punching someone in the face or, you know, um, doing self-harm to ourselves. That's not an empowered expression of our emotions. We want to teach children and teens how to express their emotions in an empowered way. You know, so anger is an important emotion. It's an emotion we all feel. It's not an emotion that we should feel like we have to suppress. And we can find ways to express it in a more empowered uh, manner, you know, which is what's referred to as healthy aggression. And it's something that as an adult, I'm actually exploring myself in this current period of time in my life right now, because it's not something that I was able to express when I was younger, you know, and we're all just adults walking around with these little inner children anyway. So mm -hmm. I find these practices to actually be really helpful with adults as well. Um, you know, breathing out fire and expressing your anger through dragon breath as an adult can feel really empowering and can actually help to move some stuck energy through that maybe has been been there for some time. So I also find that, you know, our inner children really crave these kinds of practices as well, especially at my age. And as you're saying, Shannon, you were never taught this when you were younger, you know, yeah. so. No, I don't remember anybody saying like, notice when you're getting angry, just the like, don't get angry. <laughs> yeah. Right. Don't express your anger. Yeah. Don't cry. Don't get angry. Yeah. So we've grown up in this time where we just weren't encouraged to express our emotions. And so there's a tremendous amount of energy it takes in our system to suppress our emotions. And, you know, that can really bring about a lot of physical, mental, emotional struggles. And so the goal that I have with working with, um, children and teens and young adults is that they learn these tools to be able to, first of all, acknowledge that all emotions are okay. You know, we all feel these emotions. They're human emotions. There's nothing wrong with sadness and crying. There's nothing wrong with anger. There's nothing wrong with anxiety, but we can, I like to use the term, we can move, move from anxious to embodied and empowered, meaning that we can recognize the anxiety or this sympathetic charge that's happening in our body, notice the sensations that are happening, and then turn that into something that can actually be um, supportive for us. We can channel that energy in ways that can actually help us in our lives. 
And that's a lot of what the emphasis and focus is in the work that I do with kids and teens. I'm popping in here, Connected Yoga Teachers, because I wanted to say a huge thank you to our sponsor, Offering Tree. A lot of you have already heard about this company because I talk about them a lot here in the podcast. I use their software. I love it because it makes my life easier and simpler. When I share anything that I'm doing, an offering of any kind, I love that people can easily sign up online, pay their get email reminders, sign my waiver, get the Zoom links automatically, time zones are automatic, and so much more. But what you might not know is how much this company cares about people and social justice issues. Over the years, I've watched them not shy away when things are happening in the world. They talk about how to donate or help people, and they also show up to do that as a company. Basically, I just wanted to say this is why I choose companies like this to work with. And I'm so honored that they sponsor the podcast and help bring this podcast to you each and every week. Thank you so much, Offering Tree. You not only make my life easier and you just simplify everything to do with my online business stuff, but you're also helping others in need. So if you are looking for an amazing company to work with, if you would like a solution for your website or your online offerings or taking payments or sending out emails, we have a discount code for you. Head on over to offeringtree.com slash Shannon. Alrighty, let's get back into today's episode with Shawnee. Can you think of another practice then? Let's say that there's a child who's feeling a lot of anxiety or worry. Is there a practice that you can do um, when you're in class, you know, not right in that moment of anxiety, a practice that you can think of that works really well or you've seen some benefit then? Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's quite a few. One of them is just really grounding. Grounding practices can be really, really powerful when it comes to anxiety. You know, when I think about my experience of anxiety, a lot of it is just moving upward and outward and just this sort of, um, you know, uncontained experience of all of this energy. And so, you know, teaching kids just simple grounding practices, which can mean anchoring their feet. It can mean bringing some self-contact to their bodies. It could mean anchoring into their breath, just noticing their breath and, you know, breath practices for some children can work really well initially. And for other children, it takes time to build up to that. Right. But, um, ways that we can just feel into and sense into our body gives us a sense of the here and now. And when we're working with anxiety, that's really what we're working with is bringing our bodies, our nervous systems, our minds to a recognition that I'm here now in the present. I'm not in the past. I'm not in the future. I'm here now and I'm okay right now. Right. So, um, and, and that takes us a lot of times that takes practice and repetition in moments when maybe we're not feeling anxious. Right. So we bring awareness and attention to, Oh, I can feel my feet on, on the ground. Oh, I can take my hands on my, how do I feel? What do I notice in my belly? What do I notice in my heart? We also want to work with bringing attention during moments where children aren't feeling anxious so they can sense into the experience of groundedness and okayness. So when those other experiences are happening where they're feeling really anxious or overwhelmed, they've already built some neural pathways and some practices that they they can come to when they feel that experience of anxiety arising in their bodies or the anxious, you know, monkey mind, because sometimes it's not, it's not so much felt in the body. Sometimes it's more of this revving of the mind, you know, the monkey mind happening and that's how they notice their anxiety. What about, um, when all chaos kind of breaks out in, a in a class, is there, is there anything in your tool belt where you're like, this is the thing that I use to kind of bring everyone, um, to this place of like maybe less chaotic energy. Yeah. And again, this is really going to depend on your own, you know, specific class and group. But a lot of times I like to just use attention grabbing 
practices. Um, I might have some transition uh, practices. We might bust into a yoga freeze dance where I put on some music and everybody's dancing and then we freeze and we have to do a yoga pose. Um, I may, you know, a lot of it is about meeting them where they're at. So if you have all this chaos and all this energy that's happening, that means that they may have some energy that needs to move through. It's not probably the time for you to say to everyone, let's go lie in Shavasana and close our eyes and, you know, um, rest. It might be, let's move some of that energy through. Let's get some movement and some breathing happening. That's going to facilitate some of that, that internal energy to move through and out. And then we can ground, you know, then we can, we can work towards moving more inward. But when we have kids with a lot of energy, you know, with more hyperactivity, or um, I call it their engines revving, you know, we, we want to let some of that energy move through. So um, I may just kind of shift myself, um, my whatever I'm teaching into something that is going to help facilitate some of that energy moving through. A f- yoga freeze dance is wonderful, because there's a self regulation component that happens there you're dancing to the music and then it stops and you have to pause and go into a pose. So it really does facilitate that ability to move from this big energy to then pausing and grounding. Um, And so that can be a fun way to, um, you know, calm the chaos, I like to say a little bit. (laughs) And sometimes we just have to move with the chaos, you know, and, and so much of it is about showing up for, for who, you know, meeting whoever it is, um, where they're at in, in the group or in the individual, we're not always going to have a child come into a yoga class and just put them in a meditation position and start breathing. You know, they may have a lot of energy that we need to move through before we work on bringing the energy down. So it, it, again, it's very nuanced. We have to learn how to really show up in a way for our students and I think as a yoga teacher in general, this is a skill that we want to, you know, be able to learn and grow is the ability to show up for whoever it is that is coming to our class or our session with us, you know, and to be able to adapt and adjust our teaching and the way we show up based on whoever it is that is, you know, coming to our class or our session with us. Is there anything that you really wish that yoga teachers yoga teachers specifically, but maybe even parents or educators who are supporting kids with complex needs, is there anything that you would like them to know about which you, you maybe you wish that you would have known earlier, or maybe there's just some like myth that frustrates you about this topic or um, something that's really helpful to you or has been helpful to those who you work with? Yeah. Well, I think that the main thing, again, which I had mentioned at the beginning is a lot of times we come into a space, especially if we have children who might be identified as neurodivergent, or we may have a child come in that has a physical disability, or maybe they have a learning impairment, or perhaps they have a different way of communicating that we come in with these preconceived ideas, right? Like we have learned these specific things about these specific populations. And we come into this space with this preconceived notion that this is what um, their experience is. And this is what we do, like in a prescriptive manner, right? And in my teaching, it doesn't matter what age I've taught, you know, whether it's from three all the way up to 70 years old, uh, every human is different and they are showing up, um, you know, in all of their wholeness of who they are. And if we have blinders on as a teacher, you know, if we come in with this preconceived idea of this person then we are creating limitations around what we can actually do with them, what the relationship that we can have with them, the experience that we can have. And the way I look at it is that we don't actually see the whole person. And there is an energetic impact that that can have on that individual when we don't acknowledge their wholeness. 
And we don't allow ourselves to take the blinders off and see um, the bigger version of that, that individual. We are actually not acknowledging their truth of their existence. And I know that sounds really, really heavy and deep, but, but really to me, we all just want to be seen, heard, loved, and equally valued. And we want to be seen in our wholeness. And so many of these kids or young adults, um, they've had to cut off pieces of themselves to be accepted or to be seen by others. And that's the biggest piece is how can we help children and teens and young adults really embody all of themselves and love all of themselves and not feel like they have to cut off pieces of themselves or um, mask themselves to be something different in order to be accepted. And, you know, that's such a bigger systemic picture that is there, you know, that of course (laughs) is always present, but we know as individuals that we can be the change in the world in these small ways that we engage with others in the small ways that we, um, put aside our preconceived ideas about individuals based on, you know, what we've learned in societies, um, um, communication or ways that they've expressed about specific disabilities or challenges. Uh, so that's a big, that's a big one there is just that, um, it's important. Yes. It's, it's good to know some of the challenges, but it's also important to really just come in with a really open mind and really understand what your internalized judgment or preconceived ideas might be for that specific child or individual. Cause that'll impact the way that they, they receive your teachings and will impact the way that they feel about themselves. And it's very, um, it's, um, you know, it's very internal, it's internalized. It doesn't have to be spoken, if that makes sense. That does make sense. And I appreciate that you're saying, um, or what I'm hearing you say, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that, you know, we might be learning a little bit, like, let's say we hear a podcast or a news article or something on autism. And then we're like, oh, yeah, now I know about autism. (laughs) It's way more complex. And as a parent of three kids, like each one of those kids needed something very different from like the time they woke up to the time I was getting up to bed. (laughs) And um, I think you're right. I think we need to look at all people like that. Yeah, absolutely. And, And that is, you know, I've been in this field for almost 30 years and, you know, autism is, um, becoming more, um, there's more awareness and I do see this just, you know, kind of, oh yeah, autistic people are this and there's, you know, this, and it's like, we're, there's a spectrum of human beings, right? there might be some similarities that are present in each individual, you know, autistic person that you work with, but they're all going to be presenting in their, their own unique way. And that's based on our biology. It's based on our environment that we grew up in. It's based on our experiences and our, in our, you know, um, attachment relations, relationships with our humans. I mean, there's so many different factors that go into, how we are shaped in the world. Um, And if we just look at it from a disability standpoint, or we just look at it from a, um, what I want to say is um, the word is not coming to mind, um, um, pathological standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. So we have all these lists of the symptoms and we have all the lists of the, you know, the characteristics of this specific diagnosis then we're really limiting ourselves from actually knowing and understanding this person in the depths of who they are. Yeah. Um, so important to look at their strengths, the qualities that they feel really proud about. You know, um, there's so many wonderful strengths for individuals as well as the challenges, you know. Um, and so it's important for us to to look at the big picture rather than just focusing on 
oh, here's this um, challenge. Let me see if I can like address that challenge rather than looking at this, the, the child from a whole person approach. Right. You know, so in my book that I just wrote, I focus on the koshas and our layers. You know, we're all these different layers. We're not just this um, one dimensional human being. We have so many layers and we're all unique and different. And that's how we want to show up for our, our students is recognizing that uniqueness and also the ways in which we are similar, how we connect to each other, you know, the things that bind us or connect us together as human beings. We'll make sure that we link to your book in our show notes, as well as your website for people who want to check that out. Hey, Connected Yoga Teachers, this is where I'm going to remind you that you can win one of the three books that Shawnee is giving away. All you have to do is go over to our show notes page, that's over at theconnectedyogateacher.com slash 350, and share a comment. Talk about what you liked about this episode or a question you have or uh, something that really made you think or maybe something that inspired you or it could be something that you know. It doesn't matter what your comment is. Any comment is going to get you into the book draw. So pause the podcast if you have something to say. Head on over there and that will get you entered in to win one of the three books. How did you go from like, I think I'll write a book to doing it? Well, this is my second book. So the first time I wrote the book, it was just a natural progression because I was in the education system. I was using these practices and I was just like, I have to write a book because all of these tools are, are so effective. I want to share them with, you know, parents and educators and yoga teachers. Um, but it takes them, it takes a lot of uh, willpower. You know, at the time I was writing my first book, I was a single mom. I was working full time. I was starting my yoga business. Um, and so it took a lot of, a lot of, you know, will power to, to get through and write it. Um, I do have to say, I, I am a writer. I love writing and I've, I've written ever since I was, you know, a young child. The second book was a, was a, 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 a much bigger challenge. Um, you know, life doesn't, pause for you when you have obligations or deadlines to finish a book. And I had a lot of um, really significant life experiences happen in the midst of writing the book. Um, you know, some pretty significant uh, trauma and loss. And I was diagnosed with breast cancer um, all during the period of writing the book. And so it took a lot of just really honestly, coming back to the practices that I talk about in the book, um, you know, every day, finding those moments of okayness, working with mantras, reminding myself, you know, you got this, you can do this. Um, doing practices that help me move energy through that help mobilize me in the ways that I needed in order to be able to, you know, follow through with writing the book. So I have to say that this process of writing the book has been such a great experience in seeing how those practices can really facilitate getting through something that feels really challenging. You know, there were times where I was like, I don't know if I can do this. A lot of difficulty with getting my brain to work in the way I wanted it or just mobilizing myself. And um, a lot of the practices I talk about in the book are the ones that I actually integrated into my own daily life. Uh, you know, so it wasn't without struggle or challenge. Um, but I do feel like it's an example of how we are much more resilient than we sometimes think that we are. And when we come out on the other side of something that feels really overwhelming and almost unattainable, um, it's like, wow, I did grow capacity even at the time. Maybe I didn't know that was happening. When you can reflect back on it, you can see how all of these tools and practices really do facilitate being able to move through difficult challenges and tackle things in life that feel, you know, almost insurmountable in a, in a sense. Um, 
So yeah, that was my experience with the second book. It was like all the things were being thrown at me. <laughs> Sounds like it. You didn't give up. You managed to get the book written. Do you think you'd do yeah. it again? Would you do it again? Well, I'm a little, I, I, I'm, <laughs> I already have multiple books in my mind that I want to write. I, I, that's one of my challenges is like, um, I have a very active mind and it's always creating and it's always thinking of the next book or the next project or the next, you know, so there's a lot of, a lot of work I have to do with being grounded in the moment and, and taking the time to really lean into the celebration and the joy and also the relief of having completed the book and letting myself have that space to really integrate that instead of jumping into another project and, you know, writing my next book. Um, I know though there will be more books to come in the future, but I'm really trying to give myself the space to, to integrate and to celebrate and be in the space of um, the joy of the completion of this one. Oh my so. gosh. I love that so much. I feel like I need to play that, that bit of your audio over the next time I want to jump into a new project. How about I just sit in the like, okay, look at, I got that done. I'm going to celebrate yeah. and just see how it feels like. <laughs> well, so much of that is like that inner child reflection for me. And there's been so much of this inner child work. And that's one of my joys of this work is that I do really, I have really been able to tune in and connect with my, my younger parts and really recognize all of the patterns that have come forward in my life to help me survive. Right. And one of those is the, you know, um, you know, sort of overriding and the, um, high achieving, you know, accomplishing, um, you know, pattern that has given me that sense of, you know, being important in the world. Right. And so, or, um, having validation that maybe I didn't receive when I was younger. And so a lot of times it's just pausing and reflecting and saying, okay, who's showing up right now? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what, what younger part is, is present and, can we just be in relationship with each other for a moment? And can we take a little pause and notice? Because maybe the there is the desire that the there's another book and the creativity is there. But sometimes it takes a pause to really recognize where is this coming from? You know, is this a survival response or is this actually, you know, and it could be a combination of both, right? Because it's always present. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for me, it's like, okay, you can rest a little bit, you know, it's okay. You can let yourself lean into having a little time where you don't have this big, giant, impending deadline above your head of writing a book, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> yeah. and it's okay to be in that state of not having to feel all of that sympathetic charge in your system all the time, if that makes sense, right? Be, so we have these patterns of ways that we engage with the world through our nervous system states. And that's, I've, I've learned so much about myself through this process. And I really have learned a lot about ways that I can help myself be more present in my life and try to really slow down and create a little more space. You know, like, can I have some spaciousness and just being in the completion of this book? And really leaning into that without having to move on to the next chapter just yet. Oh, I love it. I'm going to try and do this with the next season. I'm like really all about summer in my garden. and You know, fall is still harvest. It'd be interesting to see if I can do that instead of, because someone was like, what do you, what's the next thing you do in your garden? I was like, well, then you can plan for next year's garden. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I really think about this well mm. doesn't that give us a sense sometimes of like um stability and security when we can prepare for the future right right, right. and so um you know and that's so that's that is something that is definitely um an experience I have that I know for me the planning is okay if I can plan for the future 
and I know what to expect. Right. Yeah. So, so fascinating when we just take a pause and we start to recognize our patterns and recognize ways that we can show up for ourselves a little, a little more, um, you know, and this self-reflection has come a lot from a lot of the practices that I've been able to explore and experience over the past few years. I mean, both in the yoga therapy, but also in the somatic experiencing um, tools that I've learned. That's been really powerful for me. And um, yeah, it's been a really a, a huge learning experience through this whole process. That's really cool. I love how you said brains, bodies, and abilities. You know, we all we all have <laughs> these three things to look at. And the brain yeah. is very fascinating when we start to look at how ours is working, how all of the people we're in relationship with, um, how their brains, bodies, and abilities are showing up and um, to make lots of room for that in our classes. Thank you so much. If our listeners have questions, I would encourage them to go and post those questions in the show notes of this episode. And we'll just try and get those answered because we haven't really talked about this much on the podcast. And I also encourage them to check out your books and your courses. So thank you for your time today. Thank you, Shannon. I'm I'm always just so um, grateful when I get the opportunity to share. And um, yeah, I look forward to connecting with the community. Any questions that anyone has, I'm, I'm so happy to, to answer and to engage in that conversation anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shawnee, for this interview today, for sharing all of your wisdom with our connected yoga teachers and for the work that you're doing in this world. It's amazing. And I'm so excited that we covered this on the podcast. We've never talked about this on the podcast of teaching to children with special needs. If there is ever an episode where you think, hmm, Shannon's never covered that, don't worry. Like, I feel like we've done a few of those lately. Let me know if we're missing an episode, if there's one that you wish that we would cover. Again, do not forget to go over and enter the draw to win one of the three books that we're giving away. It's called Yoga Therapy for Children and Teens with Complex Needs. So head over to the connectedyogateacher.com and then look for episode 350, or you can just type in the connectedyogateacher.com backslash 350. Leave a comment there in the show notes, and we will be then choosing three winners of those books by the end of two weeks. We also really appreciate it when you rate, review, share the podcast, and also make sure that you're subscribed to it if you're not already so that you can catch the newest episode when it comes out. It comes out every single Monday. And you can also look back through our huge library, years and years of podcast episodes. You can jump around and see what pops out at you or go have a listen. Oh my gosh, I kind of cringe if you're going to go listen all the way at the start because I did not know what I was doing when I was podcasting. We'll see if you can hear that. Actually, someone reached out to me and said, I really like those earlier episodes. And I think, am I getting worse? <laughs> so you tell me, is there something that you're missing from those earlier episodes? Let me know. I always love to hear your feedback. Let me know what topics you'd like me to cover, what questions you have as a yoga teacher. That information is really what fuels this podcast. And if you want to get together in real time, we have a couple of really fun calls coming up inside of Pelvic Health Professionals. So you can head on over to pelvichealthprofessionals.com to join or to check out these calls. In December, we're going to be talking more with Tyla Arneson, who was on the podcast with us not too long ago. We're going to be focusing in and talking about cancer and pelvic health in that talk. It's an hour long and it's online through Zoom. And then in January, Lauren O'Hagan is coming in to talk about the connection of our pelvic floor and the feet. I'm really excited about that. So again, to join, head on over to pelvichealthprofessionals.com. Next week on the podcast, another real niche that we're talking about is water yoga. I'm really glad that Krista and I finally got a chance to talk about this on the podcast. Krista has been teaching aqua yoga or water yoga for years 
And she talks about what it's like to have such a niche and how she's made that work, how she has grown her business to the point where she has also published a book. I'm really excited that you get to learn from Krista next week. So if you've ever thought about how can I do some yoga when I'm in the pool or how could I add something in and teach water yoga, this is a great episode to have a listen to. Thank you so much to our amazing team over here making this podcast possible, Suzanne Crunch and Sinead. I'm so grateful for the three of you. Thank you also to you, dear listener. You're here all the way to the end of the podcast. I'm super grateful for your time. I know that you're busy and there are lots of things to keep up with as a yoga teacher, as a human walking on this planet. And it just really means so much to me that you hung out here today, learned from Shawnee, and I hope you entered the book draw as well. And I'm excited that we get to connect again next week. As usual, I have a question for you before we go. What will you be doing this week to stay connected? to yourself, your yoga practice, and to your community so that you can share the yoga that lights you up.